Good evening, everyone. My name is Ed Jerome, and I am, would like to welcome you to the second annual celebration of the legacy of Walter Cronkite. Several years ago, Walter, also known as Mr. C to many, spoke to our seventh and eighth graders for one hour and a half at the Egertown School Library, answering questions and giving his perspective on history. What an opportunity for all of us. He mesmerized all who were in that room that day, and as, as has his reporting of the news mesmerized all of us for decades. Thank you for helping us honor his memory and the rich legacy he has left behind. Mr. Ray Ellis has been painting for over 70 years. He has received the Distinguished Salamun, excuse me, Salma Gundy Medal of Honor for Lifetime Achievement in the Arts. He and Walter collaborated on a series of art books celebrating the American coastlines, and he has published many books since. From 1998 to 2000, he was commissioned by President Clinton and First Lady Hillary Clinton to create the White House's official Christmas card. He has been a generous contributor of his time, expertise, and paintings to many island endeavors, and I have had the pleasure of working with Ray for the last 24 years. Please welcome Mr. Ray Ellis. Walter Cronkite. 
um, a couple of decades ago. Uh, what was not, uh, I must tell you, my most trusted tennis partner. <laughs> you could count the times he and I lost to Mike Wallace and Lucy Hackney because Walter was at net thinking about his next broadcast or uh, plotting a sailing victory or a party. We had such fun sailing. Mary Wallace and I would think summer hadn't begun until Walter called to invite us out. And we'd hurry to walk with him and Betsy from their house down to the dock in Katama, picnic baskets in hand, anticipating Walter at the wheel, full sail, the wind behind our back. Our next speaker is an exceptional public servant on Martha's Vineyard for so many years. He is a true native-born vineyarder and has been a long time selectman in Edgartown. His voice has been influential in island politics for decades, and he has been the Grand Marshal of our island's 4th of July parade for many, many years. Ted is a retired colonel in our armed forces and a member of the famous 82nd Airborne in World War II. You may have recently seen the CBS special of his return to Normandy on June 6 to the bridge he hadn't seen since 1944, the bridge he was to secure from German use when he parachuted in with his division. He earned the Purple Heart and the Bronze Star. Please welcome Mr. Ted Morgan. Basically, I think he wanted to talk about World War II, he being a correspondent at that time and, uh, and I being a veteran. And we had a long discussion about that. And one of the things that he told me was that he and Andy Rooney and another uh, war correspondent had tried to, get, tried to get permission to fly a bombing mission over Berlin. And they were actually trying to get permission to fly in B-17s. And they finally did get permission. And at the time that they got permission, there was a commander of a B-24 outfit with them. So Andy and Walter decided to go in the B-17. And the commander of the B-24 unit asked one of them to go with him in another mission over Berlin. Unfortunately, uh, Walter and Andy came back and the other correspondent didn't make it. So, um, uh, had he gone with Walter and Andy, he probably would have come back. And in the meantime, uh, I'd get together for lunch with him and he knew my regimental commander, he knew my division commander during World War II and we'd uh, tell war stories. It was most enjoyable talking about primarily World War II in his days as a correspondent, and uh, I'll miss that. Thank you very much. Kathy Conkright is an author, mental health advocate, public speaker, and the beloved daughter of Walter. While fighting her battle with depression, she discovered that others, including many celebrities, had suffered from the same debilitating disease. This discovery prompted her to write the highly acclaimed On the Edge of Darkness, Conversations About Conquering Depression, a collection of interviews with celebrities who fought depression, including Mike Wallace, Joan Rivers, Dick Clark, Kitty Dukakis, John Kenneth Galbraith, and William Styron. Please welcome Kathy Concrete. Thank you, Ed. Um, I want to be sure that people know that Ed is very special to us. 
that Dad's last summer in the vineyard when he couldn't sail anymore, uh, Ed took us out numerous times on his big powerboat. And we have wonderful pictures of Dad sitting at the back of the boat and um, just watching the harbor, waving at people, enjoying being out on the water so much. Um, and then, of course, there was the memorable day <laughs> when um, we had anchored off uh, Cape Pogue and dragged the anchor and ran into a little bit of trouble. And um, we had my son diving overboard, trying to straighten it out. We had finally had to, to bring in some professionals to uh, get us off and get us going again. But um, nobody minded. We were having a great day on the water. So we, you know, we didn't have to be anywhere. It was great. It was wonderful. And of course, Ed handled the whole thing with great aplomb. So um, thank you for that, Ed. And of course, I also want to speak, thank the speakers um, who have said such kind words about Dad and um, for David's fabulous music. I just, uh, I hadn't heard you in too long, David, and that was a, a wonderful treat for us. So thank you all. Of course, you know we're all here to celebrate the heroes of the Stone Soup Initiative and the Martha's Vineyard Youth Initiative and their dedication and hard work, and that is more than just trite words. I've been around the last week with uh, everybody, the young people and Mary Ann and uh, everybody who worked to put this thing together and um, to do the work that they have done year round, year after year, for not only this island, but for islands around the world and globally. Um, I'm very appreciative for the time we have spent, and the, I, I'm inspired by everything that you do, and particularly by the young people I've been able to meet. Um, I, I'm sorry I wasn't here last year to, to see that presentation too, because I, I know you had a great group that year as well. Um, the beautiful spirit that you create to inspire youth to their dreams of a better world, and more importantly, giving them the skills to create it. One thing that he was passionate about was the necessity of educating young people to be global citizens. What many people don't know about my father is that he was a passionate patriot and a believer in our constitutional democracy. And at the same time, he knew that democracy cannot work without an educated people. He loved this island and the Caribbean and knew that the problems here were a microcosm of problems facing the world community. So tonight, we're celebrating, not my dad, but we're celebrating Megan Madonna and Martha's Vineyard Charter School senior who's already making her mark in film. She has an interest too in broadening her global skills through formal education in college, through travel, and through language studies. Her love of teaching is expressed through media such as in her film Far From Home, The Journey of America's Food, in which she depicted the importance of local food sustainability and the farms on the, here on the island. Our second honoree is Len Morris, a man who is using the film media to bring attention to global cruelty and exploitation of children. It's too easy for us to think that this is a problem of somewhere over there. And in his films, he educates Americans that these are problems we also must solve at home. I'm honored to present the second Walter Cronkite Awards. Megan. I have to tell you how delightful it's been getting to know Megan just a tiny bit over the last few days. This is a young woman that I adore. <laughs> I really, I think you're terrific. So the citation um, says to Megan McDonough for her humility, integrity, hard work, dedication to use the power of the media to feature inspiring young people on Martha's Vineyard and around the world. Congratulations. We have something else. Um, this is a certificate of recognition from Senator John Kerry. And um, it recognizes you, and it says, in his own words, I'm proud to congratulate Megan McDonough for her outstanding and unwavering dedication to the young people of her community. 
Her leadership is evident through her founding of the Martha's Vineyard Youth Leadership Initiative. Her effort in communicating to her peers through new media shows her innovation and commitment to the organization's goal of building a sustainable future for both individuals and the community at large. Through her selfless efforts, she is able to encourage the young people in her community to raise their voices for what they believe. I am honored to join in celebrating her acceptance of the 2011 Walter Cronkite Award, John F. Carey. And one more thing, a copy of my dad's book. for teaching me the skills I needed to achieve. Walter Cronkite was an accomplished TV journalist, but he was so much more than that. He brought life and passion to the night news. He made people feel like they were a part of something, something bigger than themselves. Walter Cronkite allowed people a glimpse into worlds they would never have known otherwise. He was a part of a generation of journalists who strive for the truth, instead of the money and power many journalists strive for today. Walter Cronkite was humble. He wasn't in his job for his ego. He felt a strong sense of purpose and responsibility to bring the truth into the eyes of the world. And that's exactly what I hope to do with my dream job of becoming an educational media director. The first time I held a camera, I was in middle school. I was blown away by my ability to capture the words and ideas that the world had, turning them into something permanent. Being a part of Martha's Vineyard Youth Leadership Initiative has reopened that passion within me to get to the truth. I feel we are a culture with a habit of listening to it a select few and ignoring the rest. There are a lot of young people with great stories, young people who would and can go for it. They just need to be listened to and supported in their dreams. Being a Martha's Vineyard Youth Leadership Initiative member has given me an opportunity to capture young people's dreams, experiences, and actions, turning them into something permanent, something adults were willing and ready to listen to. Creating, creating the Martha's Vineyard Youth Leadership College Field Trip video was definitely a learning experience. But knowing that I was filming something that had the power to inspire other young people to visit colleges and ultimately fulfill their dreams was one of the most amazing feelings I've ever had. Yes, some teens are scared to leave home for college but most dream of making changes in the world and with the, it, within their own life. We want to be someone, do something. We just need a little help along the way. I've really enjoyed watching the Martha's Vineyard Youth Leadership Institute young people grow. We have had, we've worked hard and are realizing our dreams. We are part of a team just like Walter Cronkite. He believed in being part of a team. He believed in building a better world. So let me end by quoting Walter Cronkite. As journalists, our job is only to hold up the mirror to tell and show the public what has happened. Thank you so much for being here tonight, and it's just such an honor to get this award. Beautifully 
done, Megan. So our second awardee is Len Morris. And um, I I'm not sure on um, this island that he needs much introduction, but he is, of course, a man who is using the film media to bring attention, as I said, to uh, the issues of children around the world. <clears throat> and for that, we owe him great honor. Now, if I can find the right page. Um, his citation, his award, the Walter Cronkite Award, reads, for his integrity, courage, commitment, leadership, and vision, using the power of the media to awaken the world to the causes and best practice solutions to child labor, children on the streets, and chronic poverty. I want to honor him also for his mentorship of youth like Megan um, in helping them develop their careers to do the similar work to what you do. Congratulations, Lynn. Come up and get your award. I'm going to read the um, John Kerry citation as well. Thank you. From the Honorable John F. Kerry, recognizes Lynn Morris. He says, I am proud to congratulate Lynn Morris for his years of dedication of highlighting and addressing human rights violations. His work in film has shed light on the issues of child labor, homelessness, and chronic poverty among young people. Len has provided potential solutions to these global problems through unique media outlets and influential speaking engagements. His devotion to the welfare of impoverished children is commendable, and I applaud him in his effort to advocate for the rights of young people throughout the world. I am honored to join in celebrating his acceptance of the 2011 Walter Cronkite Award, John F. Carey. Well, um, many thanks for this honor. Most of you know that I'm actually the front man for Galen Films. Galen Films <clears throat> is a group of five people who have worked together for 20 years. That would be Petra Lent, Chris Mara, Barbara Dupre, and my wife and partner, George Morris, who's right there. So um, when you give this award to me, you're all, this is the group of people that you're honoring, uh, my extended family. For the past dozen years, the films that we work on have dealt with children. Stolen Childhoods was the child labor movie that we spent seven years making. Rescuing Emmanuel is about the hundred million children who live and die on the streets in plain view but somehow remain invisible. This year we're gonna be releasing The Same Heart, which is a movie about children in extreme poverty. And the cast for The Same Heart includes seven Nobel Peace Laureates and an ethicist, Dr. Peter Singer, talking about basically how to keep children off the streets and out of hard labor. We make films about children for a very simple reason. Children depend on adults for all of their ba basic needs. You can't tell a, a hungry five-year-old to just go get a job. Making the movies has changed just about every aspect of my work and personal life. And it's opened me up to a world of people who do great things for kids. And on the vineyard, we have more than our share of individuals and organizations who really rock it for kids. And maybe it's something about being on an island. I think we're all looking to connect, and I think that we're all trying to make things better. We wanted to take some of that work and create a community that we could share to inspire people and to share information. And so in 2008, we started an online news agency for children's rights called Media Voices for Children. And as of today, over 120 organizations contrib contribute the content at mediavoices.org. News, 
research, film, video, photography, all about the state of children around the world. And you'll also find that the vineyard groups are well represented on the site as well. So uh, check that out, mediavoices.org. We had 100,000 visitors to the site last year, about, depending, two, two to 300 a day. Today, I think more than at any time in my memory as a journalist, we need to revisit the spirit and values of Walter Cronkite's brand of journalism. Because today, we have a news cycle that's filled with celebrity gossip, lurid crime, punditry, and a preoccupation with money. But in that same world, and absent from those newscasts, are the 24,000 children who die every day from preventable causes, including hunger in a world of plenty, and from diseases for which we have cures. For example, today, two and a half million children have, have AIDS. Five million teenagers are infected with AIDS. But less than a third, 28%, according to the United Nations, receive the medicines that they need to stay alive. So as a result, a half a million children will die this year from AIDS. Today, one, <clears throat> one child in three is hungry. Over a billion children. Another billion are malnourished. One child in seven doesn't have enough food to eat here in America. Now, Walter would say at the end of his broadcast, and that's the way it is. But I think that that's not how it has to be. We need these young leaders. We need them to help us change what is to what can be. We need to become aware consumers and not buy goods and food that are produced by child or slave labor. And we have a half million children in America, by the way, picking the fruits and vegetables that we eat. We need activists to demand from governments the ARV drugs for AIDS become available to children around the world for free. Curing children of preventable disease shouldn't be a profit center for pharmaceutical companies. We need to feed hungry children. The World Food Program does great work. They need more money. Today, I think our young people, and I have a 24-year-old daughter and a 27-year-old son, I think that they understand that you don't have to wait for government or your parents' generation to make changes like these happen. Volunteering your time, raising money, Becoming an advocate for children is as easy as using your internet search engine. And you can start at mediavoices.org. Or, alternatively, you could drop some change into one of these edu Kenyan Education Fund donation boxes. We've been running this particular program since 2002. The island supports it. It provides educations to former child laborers in Kenya, kids who are picking coffee and tea. We've had about 250 children pass through the program since 2002. It's a lot better to get to send them to school than to see them go into hard labor or end up on the streets. Over two dozen island businesses have these boxes at their cash registers, and uh, you know you could drop some money in on your on your way out. Look for them if you would. Several of the kids that we've supported are now in college. Um, after years of support in primary school and high school. Now they're studying engineering and law instead of picking coffee. A high school or a college education in Kenya has a dramatic effect, not just on the graduate, but on the entire family, even the village. Many of these kids return home to become nurses, doctors, teachers, or a new breed of farmer. In September, Georgia and I are going to go back to Kenya. We're going to finish work on the same heart, and we're also going to check on every one of the 23 kids that we're currently supporting in the Kenyan Education Fund so that you'll be able to meet them on video 
at our next uh, community fundraiser, our next Harambe. So please um, feel free to contact us if you have any interest in helping us with this program because school tuitions have a way of coming around year after year after year and these kids value the opportunity to go to school and so they're very successful. And I would say that this money is the money that I worry about raising more than anything else, the tuition for these kids. Education is absolutely key. It's the key to ending child labor. It's the key to breaking the cycle of poverty. It's the key to empowering girls. It's the key to halting the spread of HIV. In 2006, during an interview about the state of children in the world with all these dire statistics, Nobel laureate and Archbishop Desmond Tutu told me something that I'll never forget, and I, I will leave you with his words. He said, don't think of these kids as figures on a page. Picture the face of a child you love. Picture your own child. Now that's a man that knows how to motivate. Thank you very much. Judith Carlin serves on the Stone Soup Leadership Institute's Advisory Council and is featured in the book Stone Soup for the World, Life-Changing Stories of Everyday Heroes. She is the executive director of the Center for Community Democracy and Democratic Leadership, University of Massachusetts in Boston. She has served in senior policy and executive positions at the state, federal, and local levels. As director of the Massachusetts Office of Federal State Relations, she has championed state support for the Wampanoag tribe's application to become federally recognized. She's worked with the Dukes County Health Council to launch health access and health insurance initiatives. Please welcome Judith. Good evening. Um, I'm happy to be here on behalf of the Stone Soup Leadership Institute, um, and I want to add my, our congratulations on behalf of all that long list of people to the honorees and awardees. The Stone Soup Leadership Institute, which is the parent of the Martha's Vineyard Youth Leadership Initiative, um, has a mission to prepare young emerging leaders to build a sustainable world. I want to say it again. It's to prepare young emerging leaders to build a sustainable world. I wonder if the rest of the young um, emerging leaders, in addition to Megan, would stand up. Thank you. Now you've heard a number of people say that there are lots of programs that encourage youth leadership, that there are lots of programs that support youth, and there are, and they're wonderful ones. So what is distinct about this, and um, why do we think it matters so much? Um, I think that one of the unique aspects of the Stone Soup Institute is identifying those young leaders by making the assumption that almost every young person has the desire, the commitment, the passion, and the capacity to become one of those leaders. But what Stone Soup says is that almost all young people, and especially young people, have this kind of idealism and interest and passion. And given the skills and given the opportunity, we'll become leaders and we'll change our world for the better. And truthfully, that's been our experience. It isn't just a belief. It isn't just a theory. It is that across the country, and now increasingly in other parts of the world, we are identifying young leaders who may not even have identified themselves in the past. And they are doing wonderful things. You will hear from two more of them shortly, so I don't want to talk about what they're doing. But this started um, from a book, many of you have heard about the Stone Soup, um, uh, Stone Soup for the World, 
which is stories of leaders, but the leaders are not just Gandhi and King and Chavez and Roosevelt. The leaders are also ordinary people who have found the means and found the way to do rather extraordinary things. And the curriculum that was developed from this book is now in 120 places around the country. A curriculum that says, what is it that we can learn? What are the examples that we can benefit from? What is it that children, and forgive me, but you all are children, right? Um, but children, can do to better the world around them, not just improve themselves. I, I've talked to um, the students here and elsewhere, and what they talk about in terms of the initiatives is that it has given them the skills and the opportunity, and they said something else. They said it gave them the confidence because someone else believed in their vision of what they could be and who they could be and what they could do. So the opportunity presented to these youngsters is by opening doors, by showing them the horizons that they themselves have seen and identified, and telling them that the wishes and the fantasies that people thought they had were not fantasies, but they're real. And they're things that you can do and that you will do. It's interesting to me that um, although this program has been in Oakland and other parts of California and Cincinnati and other places, it seems to have gotten great purchase in islands, on islands. Now, um, it's interesting to me because islands are somewhat closed systems for good and for ill. Islands um, often have a great deal more self-examination about what kind of community they are than a lot of other places. People that I have met on islands often think about what it means to be on an island. So what is it about this? And one might look at a place like Vieques and say, well, what does it has, have in common? It's a very, very different history. You remember Vieques was the island that was bombarded by the Navy, right? People have discovered the beauty of Vieques and the same kinds of pressures that you're finding here. What do you, how do you have balanced development? How do you have sustainable development? How do you have growth and not change the character or the nature and the good things that are on an island? And that is the case in all of these places. So what is the other thing about our initiative? It is to identify and support emerging young leaders as they plan for and work on sustainable development. After all, who has a greater interest in sustainable development than young people. They're going to be here far after the rest of us are. They are seeing the changes now. They know what has worked for them as a society on these islands, and they know what threatens it. They know how much of it is an opportunity, how much change is an opportunity, and how much change could um, denigrate the nature of that very um, lovely life that they like on the islands. What the Stone Soup Institute does on these local initiatives is to say to young people, work. Tell us what works about these islands. What is the beauty of these islands? What are, the, what are their assets? Where do they need to go? And you tell us how you're going to make it better. You tell us what you would do if you were in charge, and you tell us what you need to have in terms of collaboration, cooperation, support, um, to make this a reality. The youngsters have um, all kinds of elements to their program. There's college and career, because many of them have not in the past been told that they had college in their future. They do service learning, because as I said, they're committed, they're compassionate. They're really concerned about the world around them. They do internships, they learn about partnerships, but much of what they do is develop an appreciation for who they are, who the people are around them, what they can do, and to understand that through programs like this, we show that we believe in them. They're determined to leave a legacy, and um, I can't wait to see what it turns out to be. Thank you.
Josue Cruz received the Walter Cronkite Award for 2010. This summer he served as the director of the Martha's Vineyard Youth Leadership Institute's <coughs> annual Youth Leadership Summit, Summit for Sustainable, uh, excuse me, Sustainable Development. Please welcome Josue. Good evening, everyone. It's been a great evening for me, and it's been, I am really happy for Megan and uh, Ellen for all the work they are doing in this community and the world. And I am really inspired for the, what, something that you did said, and I think it is that it's very important. When we talk about sustainability, sustainable future, sustainable island, sustainable world, is to take care of what these young people have to say. Because at the end, the reality of sustainability, what is coming next is what they are going to be living on. So I think that's very important when we talk about sustainability. And so uh, at the end of the journey, after, all, uh, after this year of being the Walter Cronkite Award winner, I would, like to, uh, I would like to say a few words that I wrote, just so you know, Spanish is my first language, so I wrote something in English, so I can share with you what I have to say. Uh, winning an award always represents a reason to celebrate, but more than that, it is a commitment to grow as a human being by helping others to carry their vision and join forces for the common welfare. Believe me, every single person have a, purpose, have a purpose and a reason in this life. Since last summer, I had the opportunity to grow in what I call the next level. That level where you realize that your mission is to honor the legacy of people that were here before you and they also grew up to make this world a better place for you and for me. Being the Walter Cronkite Award winner under any circumstances made me feel different to the people around me but I realized that since that moment, I was carrying the legacy of a man of changes that defeated those ideas that others would never have defeated. A man that today represents the image of a responsible and human journalism. I can proudly say that many have been the accomplishments I have, been, I have done since winning this award. Some of them in my personal life, like being accepted in the most pre prestigious law, law school of Puerto Rico and being nominated. <laughs> and being nominated to run as a, leg as a leg legislator in my hometown, but also in my professional life by helping and participating in the creation and implementation of the first green initiative in the public schools of Puerto Rico, where more than 5,000 students and 150 teachers had their first contact with information about environmental crisis and its effects on our island and, our, and the world. Also, we created more than 100 school gardens through the country so our kids learn about producing their own healthy and environmental friendly food. Definitely, these awards have been a door opening experience and I hope that this year's award winners take advantage of this opportunity to make positive things in their lives and communities. Walter Cronkite is an icon of the highest standards of freedom and democracy and equality. Yes, equality. How could I imagine myself standing here uh, in front of all of you on Martha's Vineyard and this beautiful building? How could I imagine this guy from a poor family belonging to a social minority, saying these, these things I'm telling to you today. This goes against the rules of logic. Ladies and gentlemen, these things doesn't occur with our reason. It happens because in this world, there are people like Mary Ann Larnett, um, that decided, decided to leave everything behind to do the things that need to be done and give the hope of a better tomorrow for our youth. And the work have, have not been one-sided. There have been many moments of sacrifice and tough decisions, but also full of great rewards. Today, more than ever, 
excuse me, more than ever, it's necessary that people and communities join forces to keep a sense of hope, hope to this world. Here on Martha's Vineyard, I have seen that sense of hope and commitment, which is great and awesome. Um, I still remember the first day that I landed in this, in this piece of paradise. But even more than many of those, but many, I even remember more, many of those young leader faces of the Youth Summit for Sustainable De Development last year. Wow, what a change. Not necessarily in size, they are bigger now, but, but as individuals, I still remember seeing two beautiful and shy faces of Jamaican girls raising residents on the vineyard. They barely, barely could transfer their, their life of, the life of their other spirits. But listen to me. It was only for the first hours of the summit because after the first day, these ladies discovered their potential, their norm, and purpose. There was a place for them to head up. They, were, they, were, they know where they are going and I want to make an apart to say just to ask for an applause for these girls, especially a boy and Shana, that are going to a four-year college. Doesn't matter if somebody tells them where they were not able to go. And I, you know what? I'm really proud that you are breaking all the rules of logic. Go ahead with what you're doing. I feel that something great is going on in your life and beside it. Uh, but this is not the end of the story. This summer, I returned to Martha Senior to serve up as the Youth Summit Director, and I was blown away with what I saw. I met totally, totally different young people. They were with spirits full of wishes and dreams, a campaign of the power of the world to share the vision of their life, island, and world. Also, I was shocked with the fact that this youth created the first sustainable vineyard map and presented to the state senator and the governor of Massachusetts. This is a great success. <laughs> Today, these young people are just a little example of all the great things that the Martha's Vineyard Youth Leadership Initiative is doing with this community. How proud I felt seeing many of those MBY Life youth faces going upstage, the seniors award night to receive their scholarships, to be honest just between you and I. Those kids were the start of the event. Ricky Martin. <laughs> Ricky Martin was a baby compared to them. All of this is a test, was a testimony of their effort and growth. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, there's still hope. This is the moment to demonstrate that Martha's Vineyard is not only a beautiful, a beautiful place to come for vacations and then return home with your mind full of summer memories. But, it, but that it is a place we continue creating movement that changed the history and direction of the world. I'm totally sure that people like Walter Cronkite, Martin Luther King, and Cesar Chavez with Cesar Chavez would tell us from heaven, adelante, si se puede. Yes, we can. Thank you. Presenting the Sustainable Vineyard Map, Emma Hall Billsback. Good evening. My name is Emma Hall Billsback, and I'm 17, and I represent Dukes County for the Governor's Statewide Youth Council of Massachusetts. And I'm an active member of Martha's Vineyard Youth Leadership Initiative, or MVYLI. This is the map created by the Youth Summit of 2010 and updated in the Summit of 2011. The map identifies sustainable development sites on Martha's Vineyard. To help you understand why we created the sustainable map of Martha's Vineyard, here are some facts. While there are 41 farms on Martha's Vineyard, only 5% of the food consumed on the vineyard actually comes from here. The cost of living is 60% 60 60 higher than the national average. And finally, the island energy costs are among the highest in the United States, which drains $164 million from the island's economy each year to purchase energy from the mainland. 
As an island with its limited resources, sustainability doesn't just mean sustainable agriculture, but it also includes sustainable business, supporting your local business owners, and sustainable culture, such as keeping the Wampanoag traditions alive, and supporting the sustainability of other islands. Before the summit created the map, the Farm Institute was among the few groups informing the public of the sustainability of the island. There needed to be other ways the public was informed. The sustainable map created by MVYLI is a vision for the future of the island in partnership with the Martha's Vineyard Commission because the island plan did not include the youth for the vision. The map is a visual tool that allows people to look closely to what sites are sustainable today on the vineyard. The map's categories include green energy sites that must be eco-friendly, such as solar or wind turbines, cultural sites and events, open space that is accessible to the public, farms including land and aquatic, and transportation such as the VTA bus service, bike trails, and walking trails. The map shows how the vineyard can be a showcase for island living and the future of the mainland and the world. In the 2010 summit, Sydney Morris helped the delegates and I agree on different categories of sustainability and agree on what public sites to put on the map. At the beginning of this summit, we visited the, the vineyard's island co-housing. I was amazed by how sustainable they were and all the things they were doing such as their community garden. So it was great when all the delegates agreed to have them be placed on the map. After we agreed on all the points we wanted on the map, Chris Seidel helped us to place the points using Google Maps. The cited areas included sites or areas with green energy, transportation, farms, open space, cultural events and sites that protect and improve the natural environment, allowing for ecological growth and biotech diversity without polluting the water, air, or soil. This year, at the 2011 summit, the new delegates agreed to add more points to the map and take it to the next level. One point we agreed on adding was the Gray Barn. I was amazed how the owners of the Gray Barn chose to come to Martha's Vineyard, leaving behind the oil industry and reopen it to the public to sell their products. In addition to adding new points to the map in September, NVYLI is presenting the map to the town of Tisbury, which was recently voted to be the first green community of Martha's Vineyard. We hope this allows them to see a way forward with their new community. Then in November, the Martha's Vineyard Youth Leadership Initiative will present the map at the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation Conference in Hawaii. This conference is attended by the top CEOs and world leaders, such as President Obama, to promote open trade in, Asian, in the Asian Pacific region. We are presenting the map to show what the Martha's Vineyard youth are doing to better their island as a model for the world, and to invite people to help us and hopefully inspire others to start similar initiatives. I hope this map can change the way of the island and help it to become more sustainable on itself. I hope that it can not only change the island, but can also change the world. I hope it can show the world how important sustainability is in all areas and inspire change. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. For uh, closing remarks, the infamous Mr. Trip Barnes. <laughs> wow, this is a hard act to follow. We've heard some really interesting stuff here. Walter Cronkite was a great guy, and he had a good sense of humor. He sat on the board of Sail Martha's Vineyard when we were first getting started up there to teach kids how to sail for free. <clears throat> a lot of people thought sailing was for elitists, and they didn't realize that if you ask someone for a sailboat in their backyard, they'd probably give it to you because it costs so much to keep it up. But, but I, what, what I'm here to tell it, to talk to the young people, Walter had a concern, a lot of older people have a concern, who's going to take care of us? What's going to happen next? In 1958, 
1959, I was hauling in the bricks for the regional high school. I graduated from the Northampton Indian Regional High School in the year 2000, adult education. Okay? Uh, I wanted to see how smart I really was, and I had never graduated from high school, which surprises a lot of people because many times I had told them that I had a Harvard education <laughs> or, or whatever I could dream up out of the seat of my trailer truck. But it's harder now to make a living. It was much easier. There were many, many opportunities. I started out as a milkman for the Martha's Vineyard Cooperative Dairy. It was wonderful because I met a lot of people. I delivered milk in Chomark and Gayhead and West Isbury, and uh, then I'd come back and I did another route. I delivered milk to the grocery stores. So at a young age, I met a lot of people. So there was a, a liquor store in Old Plus that needed a delivery man, and I put the liquor in the delivery, in the, my milk truck, and the co-op dairy was uh, aware that what I was doing, but I only delivered booze to people that would take the milk, so we greatly increased. We, we delivered a lot more milk. But, and, and being serious about uh, graduating from, from uh, school here in the vineyard, which is very, very important if you're going to be able to take care of me and other people, and you're going to have to learn more things, and you're going to have to work harder. And this is a, a wonderful group that is, is helping things along, that is, that is adding a plus to the school. When I get interested in, the, in what the schools are doing here, I, I found out that there's not a salesmanship course. And I think kids should be able to, to sell themselves. They gotta learn how to sell things and they've gotta learn how to sell themselves. And that's how you get a job, you sell yourself. I think you guys have a much better chance than people who are not involved in the leadership. I'm very impressed with the stuff I've read and what's going on. It's very remarkable. And I think it should grow and grow and grow because you need an extra shot in the, in the pants to, to get this thing up and going even more. But we do a pretty damn good job. And you can do a good job. It doesn't matter whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or an Indian chief or a truck driver. As long as you're the best truck driver there is, we'll love you and you can help keep my position going. Thank you all for coming. Kelsey Daniels, what's your name? Right up here. I'm Julia Cooper. Hi, Julia. What's your name? Savannah Brown. Savannah Brown. Shawna 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 Brown. Shawna